Our study this week is going to be the first study of 2024. This study is also going to be the first of a new series of studies that we're going to do this season where we're going to be taking a look at the epistle. We're going to be taking a look at the letter to the Hebrews. The letter to the Hebrews is a very interesting letter. Uh, interesting because within this letter, we are going to be going over some warnings that, that are found in this letter. There are up to six warnings that we find in this letter. So over the next six weeks or so, we're going to tackle each of the warnings with the scripture that we're going to focus on here today being from the second chapter of the book of Hebrews, the first through the fourth verse, where there is a warning here about neglecting salvation, something that we should also make a note of before we even dive into the scripture of this epistle to the Hebrews is that this letter, it literally was a letter that was written to the, the Jews. It was written to uh, the Jewish community, all of those who were able to trace their lineage back to Judah himself. This letter was written to them. It was a letter that was more so focused on those who had not committed themselves to the way of Christ. There were some within the, that community at that point in time that would profess that they believed, but they clung to old traditions, like, for example, trying to continue to keep the law. Peter, he was someone who at one point in time uh, was trying to cling on to those old traditions until he received that vision on the rooftop in, in Joppa. We have to also consider that there were Jews in that community as well that just neglected salvation. They did not care for the way of Christ. They disregarded, they ignored it, uh, the message of the gospel. And so the writer of this letter to the Hebrews was essentially trying to encourage his people to follow Christ, to heed the gospel. On that note, I do want to also make a brief mention here about the author of this epistle. We don't know exactly who the author of this epistle is. Now, there are some hints within uh, this scripture that the writer of this letter could be Paul himself. When you read this epistle, it sounds like Paul. If you are familiar with Paul's other letters, you will read this and you say that definitely sounds like Paul. But there are also other hints, for example, in the 10th chapter and the 34th verse, you will see where the writer states that they were in chains as they were writing this, this epistle, which is very familiar to scripture that we find in the book of Philippians, where, where Paul, he tells the Philippians that, that he's essentially under the watch of the palace guards. He wrote it while he was under arrest. There's also another hint that we find uh, in this letter to the epistles in the 13th chapter and the 24th verse where where the writer mentions that they are writing the letter from Italy, which is exactly where Paul was. We find that also mentioned in the, the book of Acts in the 27th chapter of Acts. You will see where Paul mentions that he was writing from Italy. So there are some hints, some context clues, if you will, that the writer of this letter was Paul himself. Another reason why, why we make mention that, that Paul was the writer of this letter is because we'll see within, for example, the scripture that we're going to go over here in this study, we're going to see some we's and we're also going to see some us's that are mentioned in this scripture. Again, Paul, he was writing to his brothers and his sisters who, who were Jews. Paul, he was a Jew himself. So he was, again, trying to encourage and trying to encourage those Jews who had not committed themselves to, to following Christ, those who had not heeded the gospel. He was trying to get them to heed the gospel. Now, someone will say, well, if this letter was written to the, the Hebrews, why are we going over this letter? As you often hear me say, when we go over scripture, even though something was written to the, the Jews, for example, here, this epistle to, to the Hebrews, there are many people in the world today who have not heeded the gospel. They know of the gospel. They know of Christ. They know of God. Again, they know of uh, 
the only begotten son. They know about his death. They know about his resurrection. Even though they know about it, they have not committed themselves to the gospel. They don't heed the gospel. They do not live by the gospel. So the warnings that we see the writer issues or gives to, to those, the Jews, they also serve as warning for uh, warnings as, uh, for all of those who have not heeded the gospel as well. So that's some, certainly some things that, that we should keep in mind as we now prepare to go over the scripture that again, we are going to be focusing in on here today, coming from the second chapter of Hebrews. And again, we are going to read, we're going to go over uh, the first verse through the fourth verse. And then again, as always, like I like to mention to you, I don't just sit in one spot in our studies. I like to cross-reference. I like to take a deep dive into scripture so that we can have a fuller understanding of the message that is trying to be conveyed to us. So let's start diving into the scripture here. We're going to start off there in the first verse. Again, we are going to be taking a look at only one of the warnings. There are up to six warnings that we're going to go over. We're going to take a look at uh, the first warning here in the second chapter and in the first verse where we'll see the first verse. It states, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. So let's point out first there from, from that first verse, the urgency that the the writer was using here to, again, encourage the Jewish community, those who had not heeded the gospel. Notice the urgency that the writer speaks with there. It says, we must, said we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. The, the writer is encouraging those who had not heeded the gospel to be more attentive to the gospel, be more attentive to the word of God there. Again, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. That raises the question, well, what had they heard? In order for us to answer that question, let's turn over to the first chapter. And there in the first chapter, we will take a look at the first and the second verse to see how the writer opened up this letter to the Hebrews says there in that first verse, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. The second verse says has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds. All right. So the first and the second verse here in the first chapter of the book of Hebrews, we have two periods here referenced to where the Lord has spoken to the Hebrews, right? He said there who at various times and in various ways spoken time past to the fathers by the prophets. So we are looking at days of the Old Testament, right? If we think about it, the Lord, he spoke to the children of Israel through through Moses, right? Moses went into Egypt and brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, brought them to Mount Sinai, to where in the 19th chapter of the book of Exodus, we saw where the Lord desired to make a covenant with the children of Israel. The Lord desired to give to the children of Israel what? He gave them his word. He gave them his law. And the children of Israel, they agreed. In that 19th chapter of Exodus, you will see where the children of Israel, they agreed. They listened to all that the Lord had to say through the prophet Moses, right? And they agreed. They said that, hey, we will do it. We will keep, we will be obedient to his instructions, to the law, okay? But as we know, history tells us that they, and it shows us that they built a calf of gold. When Moses went up into Mount Sinai to received the stone tablets. They essentially broke the covenant right away. They broke their word that they had promised that they were going to keep to the Lord. They broke it right away. But even after that, 
Uh, we see, again, all the way up to the days of David, to where the children of Israel, again, they had the law. They were supposed to be living by the law. David was a man after God's own heart. He set an example that should have been followed. But again, we know that after the death of David and Solomon, we know that the kingdom of Israel was divided into two separate kingdoms with, with 10 tribes moving to the north and then two tribes at the south. And eventually both those tribes, they forsook the Lord or both those kingdoms, I should say, they forsook the Lord. They were set apart from, from the Lord. Enter Christ, who is the second that is mentioned there, right? Again, there in that first verse in the first chapter, we're told God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. That's talking about the Old Testament times. And then there in the second verse, we'll see has in these last days spoken to us by his son. The last days that were in reference there is talking about during that time period. So so the time period that is in mind here, it doesn't seem like it's that far off from Christ. Right. So Christ would have at least still been fresh on, on the minds of those who, who would read this letter. Said, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. We're talking about the only begotten son of God. We're talking about Christ there. And again, what was it that they had heard from Christ? Again, God at first gave the children of Israel his word on stone tablets that they were supposed to be obedient to. They failed to keep the law. But then the Lord gave the world his only begotten son, who is the word, right? And scripture tells us that the word was made flesh and that the word dwelt among us, dwelt among creation, right? Dwelt among mankind. And what did Christ do? Well, he shared the word, right? Christ gave us a message of rebuke from the Lord. Christ told the world, that we are sinners that have fallen short of the glory of God and that we need to repent. We need to live in repentance. Christ said to us that we need to love the Lord with our whole heart. And in that love, Christ said that we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So Christ, he told us, he told mankind, the world to turn away from wickedness and to live in obedience to the word of God. That is the message that, again, the Jews that is being referenced here in, in Scripture, they heard that word. Not only was Jesus, not only did Jesus minister that word, but we have to remember that, again, if it is Paul that wrote this letter, Paul had been ministering. Not only had Paul been ministering, but there were several others that were ministering the gospel of God. They ministered the birth of Christ. They ministered uh, the messages that Christ shared. They ministered his death. They ministered his resurrection. They ministered that he is coming again. We see that throughout New Testament scripture. But again, we have to keep in mind the community that is being spoken to here. Again, the early church, I want to point out, was made up of both Jew and Gentile. There were Jews who had heard the gospel and they were attentive to the gospel. They, they live by the gospel. They walked in the way of Christ. Again, at that time, there were Gentiles who heard the gospel and they were attentive to the gospel. In other words, what I'm saying there is both Jew and Gentile at that point in time, there were many who had heeded the gospel. They lived by the gospel. They lived in obedience. They were of sincere faith. But again, Referring to that Jewish community again, we have to, again, remember that there were some who had professed that they believed. They heard the gospel. They said, hey, the gospel it sounds fine. I, I can believe in that. I can believe that, that God gave us his only begotten son. But their faith stopped right there at the profession. And there are many people that are that way today. They will go up and they will sit in the front of the church and they will say, I believe. And they will even be baptized, but their faith stops right there at that point. They don't move any further in their faith. They don't move, in other words, beyond the profession where faith calls us to actually move. We are to live in obedience to the word of God. Profession, as you will hear me say over the next weeks, profession is not enough. 
James, he said it himself that that if you merely profess your faith, your faith is dead without works. Okay, faith, if the Holy Spirit truly does dwell within you, the Holy Spirit is going to drive you. You are going to be moved in your heart to move in faith. Okay, so there were those who were in that community. They heard the gospel, but they they did not actually move in that faith. They still clung to the law. And again, like I said, there were many who were in in that community that just disregarded the gospel completely. And so, again, Paul, he says there again there in the first verse, he said, we must we must give the more earnest heed. Be serious about it. OK, it is not enough to have heard of God and to know of God. We must come to know him more intimately. We must we must enter into fellowship with the Lord. And that's what Paul or the writer of of this letter that is what they were seeking for for those who had not come into a more intimate relationship with Christ, with the Lord to do that, to again, be the more earnest or take the more earnest to heed the things that they had heard, lest we drift away. That touches on the warning there. You see, God calls on one to heed again this warning or this rebuke, if you will. This is a rebuke. All right. And the rebuke that, that we see there is don't just let the gospel go in one ear and then out the other ear. That's essentially the rebuke. The writer is essentially saying, listen to the word of God, listen to the gospel and let that gospel, let it sit, let it dwell in your heart. And that's something that, that many people need to hear today. The word of God, I want you to understand that the word of God, it causes one to react. One has to make a choice when they have heard the word of God. Okay. And, and the choice is an obvious choice. You are either going to be attentive to the word or you are not going to be attentive to the word. The word of God causes one to react. The word of God causes one to respond. How will you respond? What becomes clear here is that there were many just off of that first verse there there were many that were neglecting the gospel. Okay, let's dive even more into that thought there. Let's take a look here at what we see stated there in the second verse. Where there in the second verse, it says, For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. We'll take the third verse there. I'm not going to dive too deep into the third verse just yet because I want to touch on that second verse. The third verse said, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? So, again, taking a look there at that second verse, let's focus in on the second verse here for a moment there. When we take a look at that second verse, it would almost seem like for all of us who may have not gone over the first chapter, it would almost seem like the mention of the angels come. They, it comes up out of nowhere, right? Why does the writer mention the angels? Now, the answer to that question is found over in the first chapter in the third and the fourth verse. Again, let us remember, I want to remind you why it was the writer was writing this letter to the Hebrews. Again, the writer was trying to encourage, trying to urge his brothers and his sisters to heed the gospel of God. Because in heeding the gospel of God, there is salvation, right? Again, let us remember what is said in the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse. Whosoever believes in the only begotten son of God will not perish, but will have everlasting life. If you heed the gospel, if you live by the gospel, you are saved from the second death. That is the spiritual death. And so the mention of the angels here is in reference to what is said there in the first chapter of Hebrews in the third and the fourth verse. Where there in the third verse, we'll see again with the lead in being that second verse being that Christ had been mentioned, his son had been mentioned in the second verse. The third verse saying, his son who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, 
when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The fourth verse says, pay close attention to this. Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So the writer, if you just finish reading that first chapter, you can pause the video or the audio if you want to, and you can finish reading that first chapter. The writer begins to compare Jesus to the angels. And there in the third verse, we'll see that the works, the works of the angels, definitely good works, right? They, they, their works, as said in, in the second chapter and that second verse, they prove to be steadfast, meaning that, that when an angel in the Old Testament days, when an angel shared a word, the Jews, they held the angels to such high regard that they believed. They trusted the word of the angels. When, when the angels said that something would be done, when the angels would do a work, it was trusted. It was believed by the Jews in the Old Testament days. But here comes Christ. Christ, who is the only begotten son, whose work was to purge our sins. That's what's said there. Again, looking at that first chapter of Hebrews and, and the third verse, right? He purged our sins. How did he purge our sins? He died for us. He was sacrificed for us. By his shed blood, he became our propitiation our atonement offering to the Lord to atone for our wrongdoings, our trespasses, our offenses, our transgressions against the Lord. Jesus, he atoned for our sins so that you and I can inherit the heavenly kingdom of the Lord. But many of the Jews at that point in time, again, they frowned on Jesus. They had no no faith in him. They did not believe in him. They did not believe in his word. But again, they're in that third verse. The writer says that the only begotten son is the brightness of the glory of the Lord. He's the express image of his person. The angels, they aren't the express image of the Lord. They're an angel of the God of God. The only begotten son is God in the flesh, right? And then the writer said there that the only begotten son now sits down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The angels don't hold that position. And again, even more there in the fourth verse, the writer just flat out says it, that the son has become so much better than the angels. And so what the writer is implying here is that the Jews, if you if you held the angels to such high regard and you would value, you would trust, you would listen to the word of the angels, then you should definitely, again, give the more earnest heed to the things that was said in the latter days, in those last days by Christ himself. And there in the, the 13th verse in the first chapter, you'll see where the writer raises the question there. He said, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? That's what Christ is doing today. He's just waiting for his return, waiting to, to come back. The angels, they didn't die on a cross for us. Okay, they, they aren't our propitiation. So we, we should heed the gospel, the gospel that was lived through Christ. Christ shared a word of rebuke to the world, and he showed us the way to live if we desire to be holy and righteous. But the people, they turned away from Christ. And there are many people today who turn away from the gospel because of who may be sharing the gospel. If it's not their favorite pastor or preacher, they don't care. They don't want to listen. They don't want to heed the gospel. That's, again, a very, very dangerous road to travel down when we begin to travel down that road. Now, we'll see there in the third verse here, getting back to our focus scripture there in the second chapter, 
where the writer asks a question that not even God can answer. Look at what it said there in the third verse. He said, or asked there, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a a salvation? What does it mean to neglect? Well, Merriam-Webster says to neglect is to give little attention or respect to. Says to leave undone or unattended to, especially through carelessness, to disregard. That is how the word neglect is defined for us by by good old Merriam-Webster. And he said, how shall we escape? if we neglect, if we disregard so great a salvation. There are many people that live in the world today that, again, don't heed the gospel of God. And so this question, I want you to understand that it cannot be directed to those who heed the word of God. At that point in time, to, to those who were of sincere faith, to the Jews who sincerely believed this question, it could not be directed to them. And, and the reason why it could not be directed to them was because they had actually heeded the word of God. They didn't disregard the word of God. They heeded it. They live by the word of God. For all of us who are of sincere faith today, that question, it cannot be directed to us. And again, the reason why it can't be directed to us is because we haven't disregarded the word of God. We we do our best. We aren't perfect, but we do our best. Right. We we do our best to live according to his every word. And so long as we do that, we are doing good. But again, this question is is directed to those who do not heed the gospel those who do not heed the word of God. In other words, those who aren't living by faith. Again, those who simply profess that they believe, this question is directed to them. Because if you're merely just professing that you believe, but you're actually not moving in faith, you don't have salvation. Again, it is not enough to say that you believe. You must actually put your faith into action. You must actually walk by faith. You must live by faith. Okay. And and again, all of those who just throw their hands up when it comes to the word of God and just pushes it away. This question is directed to them as well. How will you escape the reward of disobedience, not heeding the word of God? Take a look again at that second verse, because there in the second verse, we will see that there is a just reward. Okay. There is a just reward for every transgression and disobedience. And again, if we look at that second verse, it said, if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, proved to, to be true. Okay. If, if, if the word of the angels did not budge, if it did not move, if it was absolute, right. And every transgression and disobedience received a just reward Okay, from the angels. And again, Christ is above, is is higher than the angels. And so if his word was whosoever believes in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. But then again, you take a look at that third chapter and you you take a look at the the follow up verses there, like the 18th verse, for example, those who do not believe they're condemned already. And so. Why should that word be disregarded? Why should that word be neglected? Okay. The the punishment is known already for those that will disregard the word of God. Those who will continue to disregard the word of God for their own word, for their own doctrine and for their own way of living. The punishment is known, you know, when, when I think of the angels and, and I think about how every transgression and disobedience received a just reward from the angels, my mind, it goes to Sodom and Gomorrah. 
to where the two angels, they went to announce the judgment against Sodom and Gomorrah. And essentially the people uh, in Sodom, they didn't care. They were indulging in sin to their very last moments when God judged that it, wicked and evil city. And so again, I, I think about that. And then I think about what awaits all of those who today, they don't care for the word of God. They turn away from the word of God. They neglect the word of God. And, and if you don't care for the word of God, if you don't care for the message that came directly from Christ, you are neglecting the promise. And again, the promise is that whosoever believes in him will not perish. If you believe in Christ, you will not perish. How shall we escape so great a salvation, so great a reward from the Lord? Even God doesn't know how to answer that question. How can you escape God? There's no escaping God. You, you cannot escape salvation. Okay, so how can you cannot escape? I should say punishment, judgment, if you neglect so great a salvation. And it's very difficult for all of us who are of sincere faith to answer that question, because, again, that question is not directed to us. And this question is directed to those who who think through the way in which they live, who think that they aren't going to be judged by the Lord. See, there are many today who, again, they don't believe that God is real. But as we, again, know from the book of Revelation, the 20th chapter of Revelation, the 11th through the 15th verse, there is going to be a day where those who neglected salvation, where they are going to be judged by the Lord. Now, this question or this warning, because this essentially is a warning that there is no escape for one neglecting salvation. There is no escape. That's essentially the warning that we see there. This warning is being shared off of scripture that we can find in the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel, where Jesus essentially uh, speaks and teaches about neglecting salvation, if you will. If we turn over to the seventh chapter uh, the book of Matthew, and we take a look at the 24th through the 29th verse. We'll do this really quickly here. There in the seventh chapter, the 24th, and we'll go through the 29th verse. We'll see where Jesus, he was speaking about heeding his word. And again, there was essentially a warning within this passage of scripture for those who choose not to heed his word. We'll see there in the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel in the 24th verse, Jesus said, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, meaning that they are attentive to the sayings of Christ, Jesus said, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And then in the 25th verse there, Jesus said, and the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. So again, if you, if you live by faith, you will be upheld, not by your own strength, not by your own power, not by your own might. You will be upheld by the word of God. The word of God, again, it is a saving word. There is strength. In the word of God. Now, take a look at that 26 verse there. The 26 verse there in the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel, it says, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, meaning again that they have neglected. This is the, the most dangerous and the most tragic part about neglecting the word of God is because the word of God has been received by so many people to the point that there really is no excuse. We, we look at the world today, the word of God, it is freely available to anyone who desires to know it, to anyone who desires to hear of it, to anyone who desires to study it. And see, it's not just me who shares a video of study uh, 
on YouTube. It's not just me who has a website where my sermons can be found, the Sunday school lessons, the Bible studies, the food for thoughts, the, the same things that I share on YouTube, the audio that's shared on the podcasting service. I'm certainly not the only one that does that. There are certainly other pastors and preachers that that have far larger audiences than, than I do. The word of God, it is out there. It is available. But so many people are, are choosing to turn away from it. So many people are, are choosing to, to neglect it. And that's the, the, the most tragic part about, about this. That, that Jesus had to say there in the 26th verse, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man. So it will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And there in the 27th verse it says, and the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. And guess what? It didn't stand. What did it do? And Jesus said that it fell. And great was, Jesus said, is fall. So neglecting salvation, there is no escape, right? There is no escape when, when you choose to, again, you have heard the word of God, but you choose not to live by the word of God. You choose not to be attentive to the word of God. It goes in one ear, out the other ear, or you simply pay it no attention at all. Those who live in that manner, those who neglect salvation, Jesus, he said it himself, okay, that they will fall, okay? All right, so we'll see now as we'll turn back over here in our scripture there in the second chapter of the book of Hebrews, again, taking a look here at our scripture Let's again take a look there at what it said there in the second and in the third verse there it says, For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, the question was asked, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? So this raises the question, right? How does one neglect salvation, right? Again, like I said, for some, it goes in one ear, out the other ear. Pretty easy, right? How does one neglect salvation? That would be by disregarding the message. Again, there were many that lived during the day of Jesus. There are many people that say, oh, if I was there, if I was there for the miracles, if I, if I could have seeing Jesus with my own eyes, I, I would believe. If I was there to see the miracles, I would believe. If I was there to hear him speak, I would believe. There are many people that, that say that. But again, there were many people that were there to, to see the miracles. There were many people that were there to hear the words in which he taught, in which he preached, that chose to turn away from him, that chose to neglect. And then there again in the third verse, after Jesus, right? The writer said that at first it began to be spoken by the Lord. That's by Christ. And then it says, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. The, the message, the gospel, it was shared by the apostles. But again, there were many people that chose, hey, that's, that's not my favorite apostle. That's not my favorite pastor. That's not my favorite preacher. That's not my favorite minister. I'm not going to pay what they are saying any attention. For example, you can see this. Let's turn over to the third chapter of First Corinthians. And we'll take a look at a few verses there in the third chapter of First Corinthians. When you get there, I want you to focus on the first through the, the seventh verse. I'm not going to go over every verse there, but I do want to point out there in the third verse, in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, where Paul to those who are of the church in Corinth said, for you are still carnal, meaning that they were still worldly. They still had a worldly mindset. Said, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, 
are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? There in the fourth verse, Paul said, for when one says, I am of Paul and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? There were literally people within that church that were saying, I'm a Paul believer. And there were others that were saying, I'm a Apollos believer. I'm a Paul follower, if you will, or I'm a Apollos follower, if you will. And again, there are many people today who will not listen to me because I'm not their pastor. And again, on, on the flip side of that, there are many who are not going to listen to other pastors because they're not their pastors or they're not going to listen to other preachers because they aren't pastors. But again, we today, we must take into consideration the word of God and being attentive to the word of God. There's nothing wrong with being wary of someone ministering the word if you discern that they are a false teacher. You certainly should not heed the word of false teachers. You should certainly disregard doctrine that that is not sound doctrine. But Paul there, again, taking a look at the third chapter of first Corinthians, he said there in the fifth verse, who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. Again, it wasn't Paul that died on the cross. It wasn't Apollos that died on the cross. I didn't die on the cross. And your favorite pastor, your favorite preacher didn't die on the cross for your sins. We are not the propitiation of, of your, your sins. We are merely ministers who have studied the sound doctrine. And we have been blessed with the gift from the Lord to minister the sound doctrine to all of you. If the doctrine is sound, then again, as the writer of the book of the letter to the Hebrews said, we should be of the most earnest to heed what we have heard. We should earnestly heed the sound doctrine, the gospel of the Lord there. Again, Paul, he went on to say there in the sixth verse, then the third chapter of first Corinthians, he said, I planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. It is God. We, when it is the sound doctrine of the Lord, we should heed his sound doctrine. We talk about how does one neglect the gospel today? How does one neglect salvation today? Salvation is neglected when we choose not to listen, when we choose not to be attentive to the word. And, and again, one of the ways in which that is done is that, hey, if it's not our favorite pastor, if it's not our favorite preacher, we're not going to listen to what they have to say. We must be attentive to sound doctrine. Again, as the writer said there in the first verse of the second church, the second chapter there in the, the letter to the Hebrews, we must give the more earnest heed to the things for which we have heard. The writer said there. We'll see here. I want to take a look again there as we begin to come to a close of our study. I want to take a look there at the first verse. Because that first verse, again, there's something that is said there that, again, it speaks to the warning. And this this statement is very powerful that we must pay very close attention to there. It speaks to the tragedy of neglecting salvation. It says there in the first verse, it said, therefore, we must give again the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. And then close out there lest we drift away. Again, just pay close attention to those two words there, drift away. And again, pay very close attention to the warning there. Give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. Be attentive to the gospel, lest you drift away. The tragic part about neglecting salvation is what is said right there at the end of, of the warning there in the first verse, that there are going to be many who will have heard the good news. They will have heard the gospel and they will drift away. They will drift away where? Well, again, let us remember that there is a warning in the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse that, that those who do not believe in the only begotten son of God, they will perish. 
That means, again, that they will suffer the second death. They will suffer the spiritual death to where they will be separated from the Lord for eternity in that place that we call hell. Now, when we talk about those who will be citizens of that place, we talk and we think about those who actually belong there according to the actions for which we can see. Someone like the devil, for example, through what we read in scripture about the devil, what we know about him, him being the great adversary of the Lord. Therefore, he is our great adversary as well. We know that the devil, because of his wickedness, the fact that he lives in opposition against the Lord and he's adamant about living in opposition against the Lord, we know that he belongs in hell. In fact, we are told in the 20th chapter of Revelation, that's where he is going to end up. Again, when we think about those who will end up separated from God for eternity, we think about those who are active in their opposition against the Lord, those who speak against Christ, those who blaspheme the spirit. They, in other words, they blaspheme the, the works of the Lord and they are loud, they are boastful, they are, are proud in their opposite, opposition against God. And, and we see them, their works, their actions, and we say, well, they belong in the place that it seems like they desire to go to. When, again, we think about those who speak against Christ, those who speak against the gospel, those who scoff and they mock believers because we are of faith, those that, that speak against the birth of Christ. They say, ah, Christ isn't real. God isn't real. They speak against not only the birth, but they speak against the death and the resurrection. They speak against the work of Christ and they are active in doing it. They are loud. Again, they are proud. They are boastful in doing it. We say that's where, that's where they belong. Those who are of the spirit of Antichrist, of the Antichrist, as Paul or as John wrote in his epistle in the fourth chapter of 1 John, we say, well, those who are of that spirit, those who are of the spirit of opposition against, against God, his promise, his work, they belong there. But the first verse isn't necessarily speaking to them. In fact, the warning here isn't, it isn't necessarily for those who already indulge in sin and they are true to it. They are convicted of living in sin. The writer isn't, isn't warning them. They know where, where their place is going to be. Again, the writer is trying to urge those who are actually open to heeding and giving earnest to the gospel the word of God. But again, there, those who drift away, those who drift away, it doesn't, they aren't active. They aren't so adamant in being against the Lord in their neglecting salvation. Think about what that word means. What does it mean to drift? And I'm not talking about drifting a car around a curve for all of you gearheads. no, Merriam-Webster said to drift is to become driven or carried along as by a current of water, wind, or air. To be carried along, to, to float, if you will. In fact, uh, another definition for to drift, according to Merriam-Webster, is to move or float smoothly and effortlessly. Then there are many people today who are active in their approach to being separated from God for eternity. But the truly tragic part about neglecting salvation will be for those who, who aren't so active. They will float. They will drift into eternal condemnation. And, and, and for me, that is the most frightening part about hell, about about that place for condemned souls, those who chose not to live in obedience to the word of God, is that hell is also, even though it is going to be filled with loud mouths and those who are so actively against the Lord, it's also going to be filled with those who were quiet, those who live life simply uncaring about the gospel. They didn't care enough to, to speak against the gospel. 
They just sat down. They were quiet. They drifted into condemnation. And again, to me, that is the most frightening part about hell. And so, again, this warning is really for all of those that are drifting right now. There are many who are adrift right now. They neglect the gospel. They neglect salvation. And they do so uncaringly. They don't care enough to to seek out the good news. They don't care enough to even speak against the gospel. They aren't actively against it. They just don't care. So this warning again is for them. And there is a word. So let's end on a note for a word of encouragement. Okay, because, you know, we we, we go over these studies and, and these studies, they could, you know, kind of lead you, leave you feeling down for those who are drifting away. But again, Christ was given for those who drift away. And he had a word for those who are adrift right now today. And that word, it can be found in the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel. Let's let's turn over to the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel. There are a few verses there that we're going to read uh, in the 18th chapter. We are going to take a look at the 12th, the 13th, and the 14th verse there to where Jesus, he shares a word. And that word, it states, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? Of course, they would. Said there in the 13th verse says, and if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. And the 14th verse states, even so, it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. The Lord, he desires for all souls to come to him. The Lord doesn't want anyone to drift away. That is why he gave his only begotten son to do his will. And again, what is the will of God? That everyone be saved, not not some folks, not some specific group of people, not one specific nation. God, he is not an, an exclusive God. He is for, for everyone, all inclusive, if you will. And that's why he sent his only begotten son to, to share the good news with the world. And so the warning, again, that we see here in Scripture for today, the first of six warnings that we're going to be taking a look at here in the epistle to the Hebrews, it's a warning that is for all of those who have not heeded the good news. The good news, the gospel, it is for everyone. When we think about what we call the Great Commission that's found in the 28th chapter of Matthew's gospel in the 19th and the 20th verse, the sincere believer is supposed to share the good news with all nations of people. We are to share the good news of the death and the resurrection of Christ. We are to share the good news that Christ has, has purified us from, from sins. He has purged sin in his death. He has become our propitiation, our atonement offering. And what that means is, is that there is mercy in Christ. And not only is there mercy in Christ, there is forgiveness in Christ. And again, not only is there mercy and forgiveness in Christ, there is deliverance. There is salvation from sin in Christ as well. And everybody should know that. And so if you have neglected, okay, if, if you have not heeded that word, if you have disregarded that word, I encourage you today to stop neglecting salvation, stop neglecting the promise from God. God has promised a great reward for all people. And all we have to do re to receive that reward is believe, have faith, and, and live in that faith, live obediently according to his word. And again, if you do that, you will be delivered from sin you will be delivered from Satan. You will be delivered from the world. You will be delivered from the second death. 
that is the condemnation, God's punishment for those who choose to disregard and neglect salvation. Okay. All right. So that is our study for this week. I hope that you enjoyed this study. I hope that you're able to get something out of this study. And I hope that you are able to share what you have heard here today with someone somewhere. And I hope that you'll come back for our study next week. Our study next week will be the second warning that we find in the epistle, the letter to the Hebrews, which is found in the third chapter of Hebrews. So I certainly hope that you'll come back for our study next week. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you're following here on YouTube so that you don't miss a Bible study, so that you don't miss a sermon, Sunday school lesson, or a food for thought. Take a moment, follow today.